Hi guys, today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donators on Patreon. Isn't that great, Andrew? It's excellent. I'm really happy that we have a uh, fantastic fan base that is willing to support us. We love each and every one of you individually almost as much as our usual fans. <laughs> Maybe more. Yeah, probably more. Um, Andrew, do you want to tell us who our Patreon donators are? Well, we got uh, Stephanie L. Terry Needleman. Max Lunig. Benjamin Lehrer. Chris O'Kelly. Lily Ackles. Danielle Reddix. Mackenzie Horner. John Donna, all one word. Uh, Taryn the Duck, who is an actual duck, confirmed. Hashtag confirmed. confirmed. On Twitter, confirmed, yes. Melissa Goldman. Jess Lightning, a.k.a. the best Jess. And she recently told us that she she's chose that name because of Grease Lightning. And I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Ewan Cassidy. Haley McDonald. Taskier. And Callum McLeod, named after the Star Fox character. Obviously. Um, they give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us, you will get tons of new bonus content available only to them. They currently have a Joseph the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat commentary that literally no one has seen anything of except for them. Um, they're getting some new things coming up too, as well as our past commentaries. And uh, some of our commentaries are excellent, I would say. I, I just... I think we're three for three so far. Three for three Not so just far. saying that either. I think that they actually are really good. And, I mean, if you want a taste, you can watch the YouTube edits of some of the best parts, so... <laughs> but those are not the best parts. We save those no, for no. our patrons. No, no, we save the best for the ones who spend who the pay. day. <laughs> so, yeah, come join our Patreon. We're going to do a lot more fun things. We got probably some live shows especially made for them coming up in the future, so... It, it'll pay for you guys to join us. Very similar to our uh, Drunken Tony's Disaster stream, but <laughs> maybe better than that. Yes, it'll be better than that. Also, we have an affiliate link. Do you want to describe that for them? Oh, yeah. Uh, we have a link on the description of all of our episodes to Amazon. And if you're going to buy something on Amazon anyways, you might as well click that link and it will give some of that money to us. Uh, doesn't cost you anything extra, so it's a great way to support us if you're going to spend money on Amazon anyways. All right, let's get on to the real show, folks. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. And today it is our 50th episode spectacular! Oh my god, it's gonna be so spectacular. It wasn't spectacular enough the first time we recorded this, so this is our <laughs> second time through. <laughs> yes, yes. We literally were in the episode saying this is not good enough for our 50th episode. Don't tell anybody that we don't care, because we care. This isn't even the first episode we've re-recorded before. No, we've done it like five or six times at this point. Yes, because if <laughs> we're not going to give you something that's less than. If we don't think the episode's good, we're not going to give it to you. So this is going to be the greatest episode of all time. It better be, or else, or else we, we don't have time to re-record it. <laughs> I know, we don't have any time to re-record it again. So, Andrew, where are we going today? I am going on a journey, and I'm not sure about you. We need to get some things. Andrew. Do you know what we need to get? I do know what we need to get. There's four things. I need okay. a new microphone. Uh, I need a new computer. Um, what, what else was it, Jess? Um, you need the cow as white as milk, the oh, cape as right. red as blood, the hair as yellow as corn, and the slipper as pure as gold. Oh, right, yes. Because <laughs> uh, we needed to... We're, wait, Jess, we're not having a child, are we? Hey, guys, here's the news. <laughs> we're expecting... <laughs> Who's the mother? Um, we both are. All right, no, we're talking about Into the Woods, which is, I guess, a highly requested one, at least according oh, yeah. to Jess. <laughs> it is one of the most requested episodes we've ever had. Yes, well, 50th Spectacular, you get it. Congratulations. Who knows what we're going to do for our 100th, because uh, we've already done this one. <laughs> I, there's only so many Sondheims left. We started with a Sondheim! Guys, for a 100th Spectacular, I'm announcing it already, we're doing the frogs. <laughs> No, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> but into the woods! It's into the woods. And home before dark. Into the woods without regret, the choice is made, the task is set. Into the woods without forgetting why I'm on the journey. Into the woods to get my wish, I don't care how the time is now. Into the woods to sell the gold. Into the woods to get the money. Into the woods to live the spell. To make the potion. To go to the festival. Into the woods to grandmother's house. The way is clear, the light is good. I have no fear, no, no one should. The woods are just trees, the 
trees are just wood. No need to be afraid, there's something in the clay. Into the Woods is a musical with music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and a book by James Lapine. The musical intertwines the plots of several Brothers Grimm and Charles Perrault fairy tales, exploring the consequences of the characters' wishes and quests. The main characters are taken from Little Red Riding Hood, Jack and the Beanstalk, Rapunzel, and Cinderella, as well as many, many others. The musical is tied together by an original story involving a childless baker and his wife on a quest to begin a family. Their interaction with a witch who has placed the curse on them, and their interaction with other storybook characters during the journey. The musical debuted in San Diego at the Old Globe Theater in 1986 and premiered on Broadway on November 5th, 1987, where it won s- several Tony Awards, including Best Score, Best Book, and Best Actress in a musical for Joanna Gleason. In a year dominated by Phantom of the Opera, that is actually pretty incredible. The musical has been produced many times since then, a 1988 U.S. national tour, a 1990 West End production, a 1997 10th anniversary concert, a 2002 Broadway revival, a 2010 London revival, and in 2012 as part of a New York City's Outdoor Shakespeare in the Park series. Also, in 2014, there was a movie adaptation starring James Corden, Meryl Streep, and a bunch of other people I don't want to bring up right now. So, Andrew, this is your first time watching it. And just generally, what'd you think? Well, I mean, as a very general question, I think it's very good. How does it rate around the other Son times that we've done? Uh, compared to the other Son times, I'd say it's... Uh, I mean, which ones have we done? We've done Sweeney Todd. We've done Merrily. We've done this. Sunday in the Park. Assassins. Sunday in the Park. Assassins. Um, I'm going to say that this is probably my second favorite under uh, Sweeney Todd. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty up there too. This is one of my favorite musicals of all time, and I'm not sure if I'm biased to that because I have such a connection with it as I directed and starred in it when I was in high school, and it just it it gets me emotional, unlike any other musical, and it has that like childlike element as well as like the very mature themes that come into it. I love the corrupting of what was morally pure. I think that's like my favorite part about this story. Well, it's very much a like a satire on um, fairy tales, I would say. Mm-hmm. Especially when you get to the second act. Oh, yeah. But it did it before it was cool to do it. It did it before the Shreks. It did it before the Hoodwinks. It did it before the Happily Never Afters. Oh, Happily Never After. We're going to talk about that one? Never. (laughs) I think that was George Carlin's last thing he did before he died. You know, I actually just watched, last night, I watched Hoodwinked. And do you know how bad (laughs) the animation is in that? It is incredible. Very, very bad. (laughs) Honestly, it makes the film better, in my opinion. Yeah, it's like, it's... I was describing it when I was watching it. I was like, this is peak trash. (laughs) (laughs) But the film, the writing makes up for the terrible animation in a way. Exactly, though, because, like, it's it's the juxtaposition of it, the, the... (laughs) <laughs> how good the writing is compared to how bad the animation is. It's, like, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back to Into the Woods. Um, Andrew, why don't you just walk us through what happens in Into the Woods chronologically? Like, you can you can kind of glimpse over the things that you don't want to talk about. We kind of know the story of Act 1. It's Act 2 that I'm curious about. Well, I mean, yeah. If you're talking about Act 1, it's basically what you'd expect, where it's all the fairy tales being told at the same time, and they kind of mix together a little bit because of the baker and the baker's wife story. Uh, the, the actual fairy tales don't actually interact at all. Really, besides the princes, I guess. Um, you got uh, Jack and Red Red fighting a little bit. She dared him to. Oh uh, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, but there's there's a uh, there's very little interaction besides the baker uh, going around with his wife, fucking with all of them, <laughs> getting in the way, <laughs> getting in the way. Yeah, but Act Two is the uh, happily ever after ruined, I suppose, where. They all realize that they're not happy at all, and everything goes to shit because a giant is on the loose. It's great. <laughs> it's great, but, like, the first act is like a video game in a way. Like, I think that would make a decent plot for a video game where you have to go and find all these things and then return it's a them point, to a it's like a It's like a 90s point-and-click adventure exactly. plot. Exactly! <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't adapt it to, like, a point-and-click adventure game like Monkey <laughs> Island. Yeah, uh, I could see that. <laughs> There's a lot, it would be a lot of songs missing, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, you couldn't do that. Um, but Act 1 and 2 are, it kind of reminds me a lot of falsettos, where Act 1 is its own contained story and Act 2 is its own contained stories. In a way, 
I think unlike Falsettos, Act 2 feels a lot more connected, though. Um, they don't add any new characters or anything like that. They don't... The giant. Other than the giant, who... The giant is literally just, like, a natural disaster, though. Like, it's not really a character. I mean, I guess so. A lot of people try to make the claim that the giant is a representation for the AIDS crisis, knocking off all of our, like, little happy family one by one. I don't... I don't see how that works. I mean, Sondheim's debunked and said that isn't true, but it's yeah. an interesting way to look at it. Okay. <laughs> we had to wait a few more years for rent, I guess. You had to, yeah, they like, had to get the, they were like, oh, got to find something with A's before rent comes out. <laughs> <laughs> the, knowing that rent is coming, like, ten years, <laughs> we're ten months away from rent, we gotta, we gotta get this shit out there. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but, um... <laughs> It, I think it feels more connected than Falsettos, because my biggest complaint with Falsettos was that Act 2 felt like a completely different thing, and some of the characters are completely different, and the arcs are, are wrong in f terms of, like, all the character arcs in Falsettos end at Act 1, and then Act 2, it's just everything goes back to the way it was before, almost. Um, whereas in this one, it feels like all the character arcs have like a soft ending at the end of act one but really they continue into act two and just change where the ending is i suppose mm -hmm. it nobody goes, back goes to an orson welles quote of like you only get your happy endings depending on where you end the story exactly that, that fits it very well um it is probably the most funniest sondheim we've ever covered probably one of the most broader comedies we've ever covered like in Act 1, was there any parts that, like, really made you laugh? I mean, there's quite a few funny lines. Uh, the, the standout funny song is, is Agony, uh, which I think is hilarious. But there's, I mean, there's a lot of the spoken parts, there's, like, little jokes that are pretty funny, but I can't, I don't specifically remember anything. Like, line -wise. I think that Baker and their wife, like, just little ways that they talk. Like, everyone else is, like, these romantic area... Era, oh yeah, like poetry, yeah. and yet Baker and his wife kind of talk like two Brooklyn like co sitcom characters. Like, we're moving, we're done. There's a witch next door. We can't handle this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're which I find hilarious. It's funny too because they have like the most tragic ending too in Act Two. Yeah, the sitcom characters are the ones that get like the most hard downfall. Um, one of my favorite lines that makes me chuckle every time, just that the way it delivers and how it sets up this universe is, it's the witch from next door! <laughs> just like... <laughs> it, well, this that's is their life. This real, it feels like a Shrek before Shrek kind of thing. Like, it really does. Right. Like, uh, I'd be surprised if Shrek wasn't at least somewhat inspired by a story like this. Like, and little things like the way that they deal with Milky White like makes me laugh like it's just this stuff like kind of styrofoam oh the the death of the cow is like amazing where it just <laughs> they just tip it over no matter what production like there has to be a good amount of comedy in the front end and that comedy has to stick around until the end no no matter how dark it gets and like that's very important to james lapine and i think that this is effective in it but there are some productions where just none of the jokes land, and it's a slog to get through. Well, that's probably just in delivery. Comedy is yes. pretty heavily in delivery. And I love stage actors. They're my people, but there's a lot of stage actors that don't know how to deliver a comedic line very well. Oh, they're, they're actors. They're not comedians. <laughs> but then you got people like Chip Zion and um, Joanna Gleason, who are both actors who can perform very well and sing very well, but their comedic timing is perfect. I guess it just depends uh, what type of actor you're casting and why you're agreed. Cast like with with a role like the Baker, you'd want to cast for comedic elements. I think you I wouldn't want to cast you wouldn't want to cast him for the serious acting role. You know, and a lot of more recent productions have done that, like. The London version, London in the Park version, like, the baker isn't very funny. He's just kind of, like, put upon and sad. You need, like, a Richard Kind in that role. <laughs> or Nathan Lane. Yeah, because really the only time he's sad is near the very end. Mm-hmm. Everything and else he's then, funny. it's kind of, like, a ridiculous sad. Like, I'm sick of all these giants and these walls and shit. Yeah, I mean, he just goes full on, uh full-on Farquaad, and he just wants to eliminate all the fairy tale creatures. 
full on fur quad. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> what did you think of the witch? I don't know. The witch I'm kind of mixed on. Why? Because, like, she's almost two different characters. Like, it depends on if she's with Rapunzel or not. Because when she's with the baker, she's kind of like this goofy character. But when she's with Rapunzel, she's like the villain, you know? Uh, she's always the villain, but she's a goofy villain. Villains are allowed to be goofy and campy. I know, but she loses that goof element at some points. Well, I will joke around with my friends in a way that I wouldn't with my family. I get that, yeah. If I'm but... pissed at, like, my child, I'm not gonna, like, start cracking wise around them. Fair. That's fair. I don't know, she locks her in a tower, which is pretty... very, very cruel. Oh, just as cruel as, like, making her bear children, locking her in a swamp, and then blinding her prince. Yeah, very cruel stuff. But when she's with the baker, she's just like... He ruined my garden! <laughs> <laughs> what about in Act 2? I think in Act 2 she's pretty good. I think she's like one of the best characters in the entire musical, and you don't realize it until Act 2. I like when she dies, which is probably her best scene. You mean her open suicide in front of everybody? Yeah, but I mean, she deserves it, though. I mean, <laughs> is she really to blame, though? To blame for all the stuff happening? Yes. Um, are we talking, like, a, a your fault causal chain kind of blame, or are we talking, like, you know, malicely her fault? Um, I think by the show's own logic, the kind of chain reaction type stuff. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is her fault, then. No, it's right? your fault. She grew the beans. Well, yeah. Technically, it's her mother's fault, then, because... It was her mother who told her that she could not lose any of the beans. I suppose so. So really, it's her mom's fault. If you keep going back like that, I mean, you're going to be... You can you can go further back than that, too. You know, like... So it's who, God's who fault. Gave, who gave birth to the mother, you know? <laughs> 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 I didn't ask to be born. It's my mom's fault. <laughs> uh, wait a minute! <laughs> what did you think about the baker's wife she's probably one of my favorite musical theater characters of all time um why is she your favorite i, I want to know before i even go in anything i think she's complicated she has these really conflicting goals like she desperately wants a child it's obvious she adores her husband she wants something more though um and she can't help but fawn over like royalty and appreciate like the finer things that she can't have and though she's resigned to not having them, when they approach, she does get tempted. And she also has, like, some of the funniest lines in the entire show, like, one that just sums up the show so perfectly, like, this is ridiculous, what am I doing here? I'm in the wrong story! Like, that sums up the entire show! I like her. I, I think that she's a pretty realistic uh, character. Probably the most realistic character in the show, in terms of her wants and everything. Because everyone else has these fairy tale goals and everything, but she's just like, well, I want more money and I want a kid and I want my husband to be more attractive. <laughs> you know? <laughs> she wants realistic <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah. Whereas everyone else wants these uh, ridiculous things. I think the only thing I don't like about her is she's punished for it. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's one of the <laughs> biggest downfalls of this, is that just because she makes the choice that pr a lot of puritanical viewers would see as, like, the morally incorrect one, she's immediately violently killed. Yeah, and it's weird, too, because they're not really punishing people in the story for morally incorrect choices. Like, a lot of the other people that die didn't do anything wrong, but with her death, it's like, oh, well, she did something wrong, we're gonna kill her. Yeah, exactly. Like... Is it because we want the tragic irony of the baker mourning a woman that just cheated on him without him knowing it? They don't really do anything with that, though. No, no, nothing like that. So I'm curious as to what, what the goal is with that. And honestly, I nobody else even knows that that even happened, other than the prince, and the prince isn't going to tell anybody. <laughs> so, so is it God reaching his hand down there and being like, you fucked up? Either that or it's just supposed to represent like, well, anything can happen, who knows? You know? Anything can happen in the woods. May I kill you? I, yes. <laughs> All right, Jess. What does the woods represent? That's what um, I, I've been thinking about this actually, and I don't know if I, I want to know your answer. thoughts. You, you're, you're asking the question as if you have an answer prepared, and I'm curious. I what do you don't think? think I do have an answer prepared? I've been thinking about it actually. Um, I've, I've been thinking that the woods represents adulthood, and a lot of the kids are getting sent into the woods or trying to escape into the woods. From their parents, which ties into the theme of the story, 
that, you know, your children will grow up and, and stuff will happen to them and there's nothing you can do. So you got to teach them right. Um, I think the woods represents uncertainty, honestly. Like, they're dark, uh, but they're just trees and the trees are just wood. Like, you can get through it. You got to go. Everyone has to go into the woods and go past into the world eventually. But you will get out of it someday and you will learn things from it. Uh, but you will know things now that you didn't know then. And you've learned something, too, something you've never knew before. But how does that tie into Act 2, though? Because there's a lot of people that don't make it out. Um, it just goes to the treachery of the woods, honestly, if you want that. <laughs> that is a part of the uncertainty. Like, sometimes you learn lessons, sometimes you violently die. Um, not everyone that graduates high school and goes out into the world has, like, a great life. Some people just get into a car accident. Some people, um, sadly just... Um, fall to addiction. The woods means the outer world, like being free of your parents. I'm with you. I agree completely. I think it's a great take. I was just, I've been thinking about that, and I was curious what you thought since you've seen this show a lot more than I have. No, and no, might it's have a great insight. take. No, I think that's a great way to view it. Um, a lot of people also view it as just kind of sexual awakening, especially in Act One. Act One is basically all about sex, like in subtext, whereas Act Two is all about sex in text. I think people just like to see sex in things, though, because I hear a lot of people say that every show is about sex, but... Every story is about sex, technically. Yeah, I mean, if you spin it enough. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I think the only He's big part of this... is all about him wanting to fuck that bike. For sure. Uh, I think the only part of this story that is directly about sex is the Little Riding Hood stuff. I don't know. There's some key lines in Giants in the Sky that makes me think otherwise. Sure, throw them at me. What do you got? And she pulls me close to her giant breasts. Yeah. And that, I, I mean, that's, know things that's now literal, that right? I didn't know before. Back to the sky. Like, that is a line that is sexual enough by nature, like, especially following it. Like, she pulls me into her giant breasts, and I now know things now that I didn't know before. That feels weird. And that's kind of the reason why when an older actor plays it, that has a different connotation to me. Yeah, but if you... when a child plays it. But if you look at it from the rest of the story... That's literal, and he just makes a lot of money out of it. So, like, you is it like he is he a pimp? Does he become a pimp? Why would he make him a pimp? He's not whoring anyone. Um, imagine someone comes well, into well, your house. Well, I mean, seduce, okay, okay. Well, sh well, sh 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 imagine someone comes into your ha house, seduces your wife, and then steals all your shit. I'm trying to take it as a metaphor, like you said. Oh, it represents sexual awakening. So yes. Jack gets sexually awakened and comes out of it richer. Literally richer. How, what does that mean? Pimps don't have sex. You don't buy from... You don't use your own supply. Jess, you don't know the game, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Are we saying Jack's a pimp? I mean, metaphorically speaking, yes. I just think that he's a wild-eyed, wide-eyed kid that, like, found a middle-aged woman, seduced her, stole her money, and murdered her husband. And now she wants revenge. That or it's not a metaphor for sex. You know, who knows? Well, that line leads me to think of it a little bit more. Like Because that. they use the term breast? Giant breast. It's a giant. <laughs> Sondheim He's singing would not about have used, giants. <laughs> Sondheim would not have used that word if it wasn't for a reason, so to say. He could have very easily toured giant chest or something like that. But very clearly he says breast. I mean, sure, but you would have said the same thing if he said chest. I don't think I would have. It's the same fucking body part. <laughs> when we say breast, we automatically think of the breast, like, as in, like, the milk I supplier of, and all that. I think of chickens, but... And, well, obviously, the Cinderella subplot has their own sexual nature to it, too. Well, yeah, but that's just because it's a romantic story. Well, it is a romantic story, but then again, she's getting stuck in the glue, goo, like, all that. That actually happens in Cinderella. Yes, and her sisters get her toes cut off. That also happens in this, apparently. The toes <laughs> and the heels. Toes and the heels, right? Toes and heels. Toes and heels, kids. Just the, the toes, and toes and the heels. Andrew, you asked me this before, and I'm curious. What do you think the moral sure. of the story is? I think that there's a lot of different morals to the story. But Tell I think what the one you think is more prevailing. I think, upon uh, reflection, I think you're right about the uh, family element of it, where it's about how parents should treat their kids. Careful the things you say, children will listen. Yeah, upon... I've listened to it a few more times, and 
that's definitely a theme in every subplot. So now, why do you think you missed that upon your first watch? Because we had a little bit of a fight in our first recording about this, where Andrew just didn't well, see I took it. it. I took it too literally, I think, in in the first watch. Because I I thought the children will listen line was more about like don't tell your kids fairy tales because that's stupid or something, <laughs> and I was like that's that's really dumb. But then then you later on decided to actually explain yourself and said that <laughs> it's more about lessons you teach your kids, and I was like oh okay that makes sense. Yes, because it's all about what we take away from what our parents say. Uh, quite often this is mixed with Rogers and Hammerstein's you got to be carefully taught, which is an anti-racism statement. Um, so it's like, if you, we learn our habits from our parents, like if our parents have addictive tendencies, we're going to have addictive tendencies. Um, if we, they have bigotry, then we're likely going to have bigotry. So we keep watching. We're so malleable from what our parents teach us. I think the only subplot that that lesson doesn't work in is Jack's. Why? Jack it's doesn't... Jack doesn't learn anything from his mother. Um, yeah, she says it. Um, slotted yeah. spoons won't what? hold much soup. <laughs> she says that. Um, slotted spoons won't hold much soup. That's that's the lesson she told everyone. Well, yeah, but what is? How does that tie in? Careful the things you say. Children will listen. Andrew, do you want to go into a mid-show? <laughs> Hi guys, today's show is brought to you by our extremely kind donators at Patreon. Yes, join us on Patreon. We have a lot of cool content coming up there. You guys should join the Patreon game. Andrew, do you want to talk about who we have on Patreon? Just read through the list for us, Andrew. You want me to read through the whole list here? <laughs> yeah, do it! Okay. We have uh, Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lehrer, Chris O'Kelly, Lily Ackles, Danielle Renix, Max Ken Z Horner, <laughs> Mackenzie Horner, <laughs> John the Donna, Taryn the Duck, Melissa Goldman, Jess Lightning. Who is the Ewan, best Andrew? Yes, Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Deskier, and Callum McLeod. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. And we need lights because we can't we can't see each other right now. It's I actually so have my lights completely off. I can't see anything. I can't see anything. I'm blind. I've I, I've got my I was, eyes pecked I've out been by blinded. <laughs> <laughs> pecked out by Boyd's. Jess, you need Boyd's. to come cry into cry into my eyes. Help. I can't find them. I can't find oh, them no. with two blind. Oh God! Oh, <laughs> I'm falling and I can't get up because I'm blind. Oh my goodness, you can't... That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alright guys, we're not going to be able to finish the show because Jess actually just died. I'm dead now. I'm dead. You know what will make me come alive? If you review us on iTunes. So leave us a review on iTunes right now. <laughs> Alright, so let's, 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 let's get back go. to the show, Jess. Let's get back to the show. <laughs> My eyes are back. You reviewed us on iTunes. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Let's talk about Into the Woods first, which is a, a very long song, but very pretty Fourteen good. minute opening number. Unprecedented. It I mean, to be honest though, it kind of feels like a couple songs stitched together though. We set up everyone's theme in this. Um the most important one is the bean theme. Did you catch it on your multiple rewatches? Um I caught it the second time through, actually, but yes. The ba da 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 which yep. also becomes the witch's theme, which is ba da da ba da It's just so brilliantly used. And then when it comes back later and no one is alone, it's just the reverse of that. The da 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 is the reverse of ba da 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 da. You know. Yeah. Sondheim's good at what he does is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> 
He does his but best. Most... He's trying. He's trying so hard. Yeah, he's trying so hard, <laughs> and he just doesn't get the credit he deserves. Guys, the Beatles are the most underrated band ever. <laughs> You know what, Andrew? I think that you're crass and I'm catty, and I am not happy about this. Yo, shut your fucking whore mouth. I am not recommending this show to any of my friends. Jess, you better not put this in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an inside joke for you guys. Into the you woods. Know, into the woods. What did you think of the witch's rap in this? <sighs> Jess, can you stop calling it a rap? That's literally the title of it. No, no, the title of it is Into the Woods. And That's there's the title a section of, the song. of it that Sondheim dubs the witch's rap. Very cool. He can call it whatever he wants to. I'm not claiming it's Buster Rhymes or nothing. I'm just saying that's what Sondheim <laughs> calls it. Jesus Christ. I like, uh, I like the witch's part. It's okay. I, I, I don't know. It's fine. <laughs> I like the Into the Woods theme better. The... Where everyone's singing about what they're gonna do. I like that part the best. What do you think of the recurring theme of wishes throughout it? Starting with this song, of course. Um, well, they start the song with I Wish, and they end the whole musical with I Wish, which is very cool. Great job. Um, Good thematic tying in. <laughs> uh, you really nailed it. Sondheim, you did your, you did your damnedest, and you, you nailed it. <laughs> I give you a 6 out of 10. 6 out of 10. Because nobody's Excellent perfect. Work. Nobody's perfect. I don't give perfect scores around here. I don't even give sevens. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, the I wish continuously shows up, recurs over and over again, and basically everyone sets up their I want song with an I wish song. I mean, if you're going to get picky about music theater structure, I guess you could call it a cop out, though. But... <laughs> I mean, when you got but, so many characters, there was no other way you really could have done it. Yeah, and plus, if you gave every single one of these characters that we already know what they want, since everyone knows these stories, uh, a fucking I Want song, oh my god. <laughs> How often is it, as a writer, do you get to go into a story knowing that the audience has so much predetermined knowledge about the topic? Like, that must be a great luxury to have. Hey, fucking just ask Disney, they've been doing it for years. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, I love the Lion King. Boy, yeah. I love Aladdin. Boy, yeah. I love Dumbo. Boy, I love Lady and the Tramp. Boy, Boy. I, I love it. I love a gum to my head. <laughs> Boy, howdy! <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't wait for the live action Steamboat Willie. <laughs> it's a porn now. <laughs> Hello, little girl. What's your rush? You're missing all the flowers. The sun won't set for hours. Take your time. Mother said straight ahead, not to delay or be misled. But slow, little girl, hark and hush. The birds are singing sweetly. You'll miss the birds completely. You're traveling so fleetly. Grandmother first, then Miss Plump. What a delectable couple. What a perfection, one brit, one supper, one moment, Mother said, my come what may, fold the path and never stray. Just so, little girl, any... <laughs> Let's talk about hello, little girl. Uh, great wolf makeup, good wolf penis, um, and very sexually charged, which is excellent, of course. Oh yeah, always great. Um, why the wolf penis, Andrew? What do you mean, why the wolf penis? Why the wolf penis? You know what would have been better, Jess? What? Johnny Depp wearing pants. <laughs> no, no, he's gonna he's gonna hurt that young lady. He's gonna hurt her. He's gonna drink an entire bottle of wine and hit her. Oh no, Johnny get Depp, him, stay away from her. Get him away. <laughs> <laughs> I was more wor I was actually more pred predatory worried about it during the movie than I was in the musical. Yeah, honestly. He might actually hurt that girl. But the way that they frame this as like a sexual like praise song as well as like an actual devouring of this girl, I think it's super effective, but it also makes me like uneasy. It makes me like kind of like cringe in my seat in a good way. It's definitely a strange number to have as the second number in your entire musical. But it's a perfect number to have as just second number in your entire musical because we set up how dark it's going to be, how sexual it's going to be, and that in, even in, as comedy and goofy this is, there's so much 
actual darkness in the world. And I think the movie ruins this quite a bit. Well, you don't like Johnny Depp wearing pants? I mean, I'd prefer that to the alternative, but... I think he should have been wearing a wolf penis. They're not hard to find. Dragondildos.com, people. High in her tower, she sits by the hour, maintaining her hair. Lithe and becoming, and frequently humming, a light-hearted air. What did you think of Agony, Andrew? It's just, there's two Gastons in this show, and it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you, like, expecting to laugh that much when you got to that point? Like, as soon as you saw them, we were like, oh boy, these are gonna be, this is gonna no, be No, I was, I definitely was not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it's they like were, you like, got a pretty... Gaston fighting each other. I didn't- I thought they were really boring characters up to that point, because they didn't really do anything yet. But then you- then you hear this song and you're like, Oh, that's what they're about. <laughs> the one-upsmanship of like, I'm more miserable! I'm more miserable, and they're both miserable about not being able to get their girl. Win their prize. <laughs> and the competitive nature of it, like, is so- And the word agony is just so over-melodramatic. <laughs> Like, it's, that specific Agony. choice in a word, it's like, we're seeing people that, like, cannot have children, are actually poor, and then we get these two, like, well-off rich yeah. guys come in and talk about their agony. Because they, cause they can't get the girl, who they right, probably exactly. don't even actually love, and then we find out, of course, that they don't actually love them, they just wanted them as, like, conquest, basically, but... They like the chase. Yeah, that's all they like. So what did you think of the reprise in comparison to the original? I think the reprise is actually funnier. <laughs> but the reprise is... doesn't work on its own. Like, if it's only hilarious because we heard the first version. Yeah, it's, it's that, and it's like knowing that they already won. They already got what they were saying. <laughs> they were so miserable for not having, and now they're like, oh, I'm so miserable because I, now I don't have this. <laughs> and I'm married. Oh. Yeah, it's like, you guys got everything you wanted, and now you're miserable because you don't have something else. I think the the Always princes represent have. represent human nature, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're the most relatable characters in the whole show. <laughs> Andrew, which one are you? Are you Rapunzel's prince or are you Cinderella's prince? Uh, I would never cheat on my wife, so I'm Rapunzel's prince. I would wait for her to die and then have Lee move on very fast. <laughs> I would wait for her to be dead and then move on instantly. I'm also very scared of dwarves, so... They prefer little people. They're upsetting. Either way, let... <laughs> they are upsetting. Um, what did you think of Stay With Me? Oh, you mean the the witch uh, trying to convince Rapunzel not to go with the uh, the prince? Yeah. Princes wait there in the world. It's true. Princes, yes, but wolves and humans too. Stay. I don't have any strong feelings about this one. What, what, what do you think? It's the only, like, real solo number we have for the witch, who is actually one of the most powerful, like, singers in the entire show by the design of Act 2. It's the only time she really gets a chance to sing, and a lot of times, it's not done very well. well. I mean, in Act 2, she gets a chance to sing, like, twice. Yes. Oh, yeah. But in Act 1, this is her only chance, and a lot of people... It's a really difficult scene to play, because... Even Bernadette Peters doesn't quite play it scary or kind enough. It's that jump between scary and warm that makes her terrifying. Like, you can still see the humorous person in there, but you need to see 
like you need to feel fear for Rapunzel, like that she could die. And I think yeah. that Meryl Streep does this the worst out of everyone. <laughs> I uh, tend to agree, yes. <laughs> Meryl Streep does not... I don't know what she's doing in this movie, and I'm sure we'll get to it when we talk about it, but oh my god. Especially in this scene, which they used in all the advertising, it's just... it's not effective. Um, honestly, the best version of this song is Donna Murphy and Hannah Waddingham. Both of them are both terrifying and warm, and you're scared for Rapunzel, but also feel the witch's, like, self-pity and hatred. It, you, It's a very difficult scene to play. It's Shakespearean, in a way. Like, all the emotions, the emotional gamut you have to go through just in this one scene. Alright, now, would you prefer this song or Mother Knows Best? Uh, I prefer this song. Mother Knows Best um, <laughs> is ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> I, I do like that. I know you prefer kind of that one. Good. No, I, I, I don't think I would. I like it's the not... reprise of Mother Knows Best. But, I mean, I think you could probably guess my favorite song from Tangled. At last I see the light. No. no. <laughs> no. Come on, Jess, you know me. I have a dream. Yes, that one. <laughs> Anything can happen in the woods. May I kiss you? Any moment we could be crushed. Uh, Don't feel rushed. This is ridiculous. What am I doing here? I'm in the wrong story. Wait one moment, please. We can't do this. Of course, you're right. How foolish. Foolishness can happen in the woods. Once again, please. Um, do you want to talk about any moment? Um, are we going to combine this with moments in the woods? or I think that's just... a good idea. Um, I think this entire scene is very good. Uh, it's the baker's wife finally giving in to her uh, urges, I suppose. Temptations, yes. The temptations. Imagine the sexy jock coming for you and saying, like, you're good enough. <laughs> fucking you behind a tree and then leaving any moment is really funny actually but <laughs> it, it's got some of the best lyrics in this like my favorite lyric in this entire musical is in this which is life is often so unpleasant you must know that as a peasant it best to take the moment present as a present for the moment that see that entire scene is hilarious and it's one of the things that the movie does better than most productions Chris Pine plays that scene so perfectly, and Emily Blunt reacts to it equally well. Yeah, I, I, I think this whole thing is great, except for the very end of it, where the wife dies, and is like, oh, damn. <laughs> she, it's a she gut like, punch. It really is a yeah, gut punch. She like, she like has this thing where she gives in to temptation, but then she grows as a person because of it, kind of. Uh, I mean, the message dies. of the song is that, like, she... Basically, is like, all right, am I a bad person for cheating? Like, do I still love my husband? She comes to be like, yeah, that guy was kind of an idiot. And now that I've had that, I realize how good I have it at home. So now to go back to what was good, what I like. So basically, this whole thing is just an argument that cheating is a good thing. Polyamory is a good thing because it makes you know what you really want. Yeah, I'm not sure that's a good <laughs> moral. Maybe that's why they killed the wife. <laughs> You're so pure, but stay here and in time you'll mature and grow up to be them. So let's all lie, you and I, far away. Please! I'm the hitch, I'm what no one believes. I'm the witch. They're all liars and thieves like him. All right, what do you think about Last Midnight? Um, definitely the most dramatic song in the whole show. This is like the what big makes it number. So dramatic. This is the eleven o'clock number. This is a big one. I think what makes it dramatic is that the witch is just such a good singer, and it's so, it's so big. Uh, like her voice. I don't know. It's hard to describe. 
but she's like I, I she becomes so uncaring and just like doesn't want anything to do with anybody and then just fucking kills herself <laughs> and it's it's kind of yeah liter find me another song in a musical that is like this where she's like all right y'all don't like me fuck you Good luck on your own, yeah, assholes. Yeah, I mean, and, but the way she does it in such a dramatic fashion, and then, I, I guess it depends what version you watch, what happens at the end, but in the movie, she fucking turns into a swamp, and then some of the, I think the show we watch, she, like, falls into the stage, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, she kind of just falls into it's a pretty black sick. hole. It's a pretty badass song. As Danny DeVito would say, suicide is badass. <laughs> Thanks, Danny DeVito. What do you think of this song? This is strangely, this will not be the last time we bring up Danny Probably DeVito not. on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> um, I think this song is great. Easily the most um intense number. I love that she just obviously does not give a damn about any of these people and the only reason why she she's like she's even confused as to why she's still there her daughter's dead she has no stake in this anymore so she's like all right i mean I, i'd rather be dead than spending I mean, any more time with you guys to, she does want to kill jack right but then they refuse and she's like all right well then completely fuck it i'm gone Yeah, and in the movie, like, in the musical, it's because she watched her daughter die in front of her. In the movie, it just comes off as Meryl Streep has a bloodlust yeah. for her child Yeah, because they, they get rid of the whole part with Rapunzel being dead or something. I... Yeah, yeah she's like, oh, I don't leaves. want to be in this show anymore, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm leaving, leaving the, the musical, musical. goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Rapunzel had to return to her home planet. <laughs> Make t-shirts of that, folks. How do you say to a child in the night, nothing's all black, but then nothing's all white. How can you say it will all be all right when you know that it might not be true? What do you Children will listen is the moral of the entire show and one of the most like emotionally gripping parts of the entire story. Like this is where we finally understand why we've had all these conflicts. I think without this song, that. Act Two is a lot weaker, just because it kind of doesn't have a point. So this is kind of like the not the punchline, but the. Uh... Now here's the moral, kids. When you go home today, be careful what you tell your kids, because they'll I be jump. listening. They may not obey, but know that they're listening. <laughs> it is kind of like that, though. It's kind of like at the end of the Saturday morning and, cartoon where they tell you what's what's what the whole point was. <laughs> and how it fades right back into the into the woods part, where it's like, it goes from like the soft melody, and it's like, and though it's fearful, though it's deep, though it's dark, though you may lose the path, and you may encounter fools. Like, it goes from, like, a very soft moral to, like, the very happy, peppy into the woods theme without it missing a beat or feeling like that doesn't yeah. fit. Because it's, it's a cautionary tale, but they're not, they're not trying to say don't take any risks. What they're trying to say is prepare your kids for it, you know? Because they're, they're gonna take the risks. Yeah, they're gonna prepare take them the risks, for the woods. And that, you can't stop them, but you've got to prepare them right. Or else they'll get stepped on by a giant. And we don't want that. We don't want your kids getting AIDS. That's not what it means, Jess. What are you talking Other... about? I read an armchair critic say it did. I mean, if they're right, though, like, what does that actually mean? Is the moral to tell your kids not to be gay so they have less chance of getting AIDS? 
Don't be a fairy tale creature. That's a horrible moral. It has this has no, this is the worst AIDS metaphor of all time, and I can't believe that that's even a thing that exists. It doesn't even make sense. I hate it. <laughs> Basically, the moral outside of children will listen is that there are always wolves, there are always spells, there are always beans, and a giant dwells. So into the woods you go again. You have to every now and then into the woods, no telling when. Be ready for the journey. Just be ready. Exactly. Bring a condom. <laughs> Bring a condom <laughs> before you fuck a wolf. Once upon a time, in a far-off kingdom, there lay a small village at the edge of the woods. I wish. And in this village. More than anything. Lived a young maiden. More than life. More than jewels. A carefree Let's talk about the movie. Oh god. Not the movie. <laughs> it's not that not bad. Not the movie. It's, it's not bad. that bad. It's I I it depends how you look at it. If you look at it as an adaptation of the first act and then they forgot about the second act, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to rush through it. It's like, oh shit, we didn't write the second oh, act. Oh shit, the it. second act. We have to put the second act in. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the casting altogether for the film? Um, it's very hit or miss, I would say. Who do you think is the best MVP in the movie? Um, I don't actually know. Most of the women were pretty well cast. Except for Meryl Streep. Uh, yes, except for Meryl Streep. I'd say, like, the baker, like, James Corden is pretty poorly cast. Meryl Streep is not great in the role. Johnny Depp is horrible in the role <laughs> that he's playing. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of bad casting as well. Do you want to hear about what almost happened in the 90s with this movie? You know what, the- I- I remember this, and the 90s version sounded like it would have been badass. <laughs> yes. So they were going to make a film in the early 90s with the Jim Henson Company, um, and it had Robin Williams as the baker, Goldie Hawn as the baker's wife, Cher as the witch, Danny DeVito as the giant, Steve Martin as the wolf, Roseanne Barr as Jack's mother. And <laughs> I think it would have been that a... Fell through. It would have been like a terrible musical, because none of these people can sing, except for like Cher, I guess. <laughs> but it would have been awesome. Yes. Fuck you. It would have been awesome. It would have been though. a really good movie. It would have <laughs> actually felt like a movie. Stephen Sondheim even wrote some new songs for it, um, like a brand new opening number, which feels very, very more in the Disney vein. I wish, I wish. Now in this village at the edge of the woods, there lived a baker. I wish. And his wife. I wish. And what they wished for more than anything. I, I wish. Was. I wish we had a baby. I want to have a child A pink and shiny baby A tiny baby A little whiny baby Who only lives to drive its parents wild I wish we had a baby Who gurgled and who smiled A pink and twinkly baby A crinkly baby A little wrinkly baby I, I think this would have been a great watch, but I don't think it would have held up as a musical. But as a movie, it would have been pretty fun. It would have been a good adaptation. I almost kind of wish this had happened, this version, only because we have the very well done Burned at Peter's recording. And I'm basically OK if a movie is going to be all kooky and different if we have a pretty accurate recording of the Broadway version. Plus, with Jim Henson uh, uh, company in there, I bet you there would have been some cool puppets and stuff. Yeah, it would have been a very weird, interesting movie with some good Sondheim songs. Kind of like um, 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 Dick Tracy. Oh yeah, Dick Tracy's a great movie. <laughs> but the movie itself, like, I really like Emily Blunt in it. She's probably, I think she's the MVP of the entire film. Uh, in the actual movie? Yeah, in the actual movie. You're gonna have to remind me who she plays, because I didn't watch the movie The again. Baker's Wife. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, she's she's good, but the problem is the baker's not because James Corden. I, I I feel like James Corden has very little fucking charisma, but whatever. I think they have good chemistry, even though I'm not a big fan of James Corden in the role. Can kind of see that. I think that Emily Blunt is just able to have chemistry with almost anyone. I think Meryl Streep steals the show, though, in a bad way. In absolutely in a bad way, yes. Because she rewrites the character, and this is a thing that Meryl Streep does with a lot of her roles, where she's like, "I'm gonna come in and make it my own." And I'm going to do all these weird, random stuff. Wow, so wow, what you're I so want. creative. You're so great. <laughs> <laughs> 
the witch is written on the page to be like this strong, like intense character that frightens everyone. But every time she's on st- screen, like she's like this wilting, sobbing, like she's sobbing almost every time. She's like at the brink of tears every time she's on screen. And like the most acting does not make the best acting. <laughs> Absolutely. No, less is, less is more in almost every situation. And then in Act 2, or the third act of the movie, she just kind of is normal Meryl Streep, and then she dies. Yeah, For she no just, reason. She's just like, uh, suddenly I want to kill myself. Okay, bye. <laughs> My daughter <laughs> left me, and I guess that means she's never coming back, so, meh. Yeah, because like, in, in the musical it makes sense, because she's actually dead. You like know? she she watched her get squished and I think she killed herself depending on the performance something like that. I think the biggest failure of the movie though is not the casting or anything like that. It's the fact that they cut the act they cut act 2 down to such a short like afterthought when in the musical act 2 is so important <laughs> and the best part. Yeah, ar- arguably the best part of the whole show and they cut it down to like nothing. So, Andrew, I, I'm curious. Is there anything that the movie did better? Uh, I think some of the, like, staging and, and stuff like that. But Is it's there not... any scene in particular? I'm thinking of, of the agony scene, because the, yeah. water, the waterfall, <laughs> and, and when, they, uh, when like, one of them rips their shirt and the other one's like, oh shit, I gotta do that too. <laughs> that was, like, really funny. Uh, Chris Pine is more Shatner-esque in that movie than he was in any <laughs> Star Trek movie. Yeah, like I think they nail that, but like that's something that you can only do on on like a film, so that makes sense that that would be better. Like you can't do that on stage. <laughs> yeah, so I I don't know. I feel like there's very little that the movie does better, and the movie the movie is almost as long as the musical anyway. So I just feel like it's just better to watch a recording of the musical. <laughs> that's fair. Um, Andrew, how would you rate the movie just on a scale of one to ten? As a film. Oh, if I'm going to give it, like, an actual review as a film? Yes. I'd probably give it, like, How a... How many stars? S- like, a 6 out of 10. I wouldn't... I honestly wouldn't watch it again. I, I just don't... I don't see the reason to. I, I would just watch the recording that exists of the show. I agree. You know what else I would do, Andrew? What's that? I would go into the woods and out of the woods and home before <laughs> dark. Oh, very good, Jess. Andrew, what is your overall thoughts on Into the Woods and your cheese rating? Um, I'm going to give two overall thoughts, but I'm only going to give one cheese rating. Uh, overall thoughts on the musical as a whole is it's very, very good, and you should definitely check it out if you have not, which you have already, and I know that, so I'm not going to recommend it too heavily. <laughs> but it's very good. Um... I think Act 2 is a lot stronger than Act 1. I will say upon first watch, uh, Act 1 can get a little tedious because you already know what's going to happen pretty much. But when you get into Act 2, that's when it's like, oh, nice. And on future watches, you're kind of looking for hints about Act 2, so it kind of is a little better. Um, as far as a cheese rating... Or, oh, no, I'm second overall thoughts. Uh, overall thoughts on the movie is they fucked it up and don't watch that. <laughs> Um, and then she's rating is a, a, a milky white cheddar. Um, I love Into the Woods. Into the Woods is probably like one of the greatest musical experiences I have. Like the musicals I have one of the deepest connections to. I can literally watch it any time and promptly enjoy myself and still chuckle at the jokes I've heard a thousand times. I love the music. The songs are stellar. Sondheim 
really, really brought it to the table. And James Lapine's book actually doesn't get enough credit for how really smart it is. Um, so I am gi- giving it Will O' Wisp cheese. Um, uh, it is a fuzzy basket of cheese from Fairy Tale Farm in Vermont. Ooh, Vermont! I love Vermont. Yes. Yeah, so that is my official cheese rating. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Yeah, hey, sure. Andrew, what do you got? Andrew, what do you got? Andrew. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hi. Andrew. Did you That's know that me. someone is on your side and someone else is not? Who's on my side? While they are on your side, maybe you forgot that no one is alone, especially not our wonderful patrons <laughs> over on Patreon, who are giving us some financial support to ensure that we're able to do what this What a segue, better. Jess! <laughs> <laughs> our patrons include Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lair, Chris O'Kelly, Lily Ackles, Daniel Rennix, Mackenzie Horner, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, who is an actual duck. Actual Lisa duck. Lisa Goldman, who is an actual Goldman. <laughs> Jess Lightning, who is an actual the best, Jess. And the best Jess the on best the show. Jess. <laughs> the best Jess on the show. Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Teskier, and Callum McLeod. Um, they all give us a little financial support to make sure that we're able to keep on doing this. Um, and we love them all very much. I want, I'm going to give you all a kiss right now. That was for each of you. Now, now we both kissed you. Now, now y'all can go to bed now. We've tucked you in. We love we you all you very the, much. We read you four bedtime stories at the same time. Uh, yeah. Make <laughs> up your own endings. Make up your fucking own ending. Who gives a shit? Nobody likes you. All right. You're, we're, uh, you're not even a real child. You're not even a real child. You were born out of a bean. Thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, check <laughs> us out on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher at Musicals with Cheese. Uh, Jess posts on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. Uh, we've already advertised our Patreon enough, but it is Patreon, Musicals with Cheese, if you want to find that. Uh, we're on Instagram, Musicals with Cheese. <laughs> our YouTube page is Musicals with Cheese. And you can email us at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Combo Breaker! Our title card is created <laughs> by the amazing Jolene Casco. Go follow her on Instagram and Jolene Casco. Also, please leave us reviews on iTunes. We're trying we're trying to rise up them charts, and we can do that with only like whatever many reviews we have. So come on. Our goal is to get two hundred by this time next year. Let's do it, kids. I think we can do it. I think we can. I think I think we have a great fan base. We have a good fan base who is very supportive, and we love them. I wish to get more iTunes reviews. Okay. Jess, that's too far. You've gone too far. You've gone off the deep end. So you're saying, no more giants waging war. <sighs> Jess, you've gone too far. You're off the deep end. <laughs> okay, we're going to end the show now. <laughs> Are we on the wrong story? Happy 50th, everybody. Happy 50th! I can't believe we made we'll it this next- far. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it either. I can't believe I was able to keep Andrew on for 50 episodes. I can't believe he was either. Here's to, the, here's to the next 50. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.